Good morning, everyone. I am Mishi Mittal, your anchor for today's webinar. Dear friends, a hearty welcome to all. We are all gathered here today to attend the national webinar, Maths for Democracy, arranged as a part of the, part of the ongoing webinar series, Maths Stasi, an online odyssey through mathematics, organized by the Maths Aspirants Group. Maitrim Bhajata Akila Khaji This Sunday will be fruitful for all with intellectual feast and academic discussions. Maths Aspiring Group is an initiative of Dr. Vinod Kumar P, Associate Professor of Mathematics, TM Government College, Pirur, Kerala. This group was started in 2017. It is the community of maths lovers, students, research scholars, and faculties from various parts of India and abroad. Apart from providing a platform to share and discuss maths, it organizes several online problem solving sessions and online test series to help the students who prepare for different national competitive exams like CSIR, NET, JRF, GATE, RIT JAM, NBHM, TIRF entrances, etc. The webinar series Maths Estasi, an online odyssey through maths, is an initiative of the Maths Aspirants Group to arrange expert talk series on different frontier topics in and around mathematics to understand and relish the beauty of mathematics. Now I request Dr. Vinod Kumar to say a few words. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Dear friends, a warm good morning to all. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the fifth national webinar in the Math Ecstasy webinar series organized by Maths Aspirants Groups. I am very thankful to today's resource person, Dr. R. Ramanujam, a retired professor, the Institute of Mathematical Science, Chennai, for joining with us. I would like to thank Professor Ambat Vijay Kumar, Emeritus Professor of Cochin University of Science and Technology, for the support and helps in arranging this webinar and all other activities of our math aspirants groups. I thank all my teachers and well wishers for their support and blessings throughout my journey. The success of any event relies upon the teamwork and I am blessed to have a wonderful team for supporting me. I thank every member of our team for their support and helps in arranging this webinar. I am sure that today's session will shed light to the new areas of knowledge and applications of mathematics to various disciplines. Wishing you all a fruitful time ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, today's webinar is on topic Maths for Democracy. It is the fifth in the Maths Stasi webinar series organized by the Maths Aspirants Group. The previous webinars were on the following topics. Role of Mathematics in Cybersecurity by Professor Abhishek Adhikari, Presidency University, Kolkata. Artificial Intelligence, Myth and Reality by Professor Chandrasekhar Lakshmi Narayan of IIT Palkar. Beauty of Complex Analysis by Professor Amar Vijay Kumar of Cochin University of Science and Technology. And Glimpses of Ancient Indian Mathematics by Professor Parthasarthi Mukhopadhyay of Calcutta University. Friends, as we all know, India is the largest democracy of the world and the birthplace of many innovative mathematical ideas. The topic of today's webinar is Mathematics for Democracy. Friends, I am sure that many of your eyes are filled with curiosity while seeing the topic of today's webinar, Maths for Democracy. We all know the importance and relevance of mathematics and the entire universe is governed by mathematical principles. 
but still we may have some wonder as in which ways maths can help to ensure a fair and free election which is of course a crucial part of democracy <coughs> and that reflects the actual opinion of people today we are really blessed to have the eminent speaker dr r ramanujan retired professor of the institute of mathematical science chennai to enlighten our minds about these topics i request professor amrit vijay kumar emeritus professor cochin university of science and technology vice president of ramanujan mathematical society of india to introduce our distinguished resource person sir okay uh, very good morning to all of you uh, today is uh, the 12th day of the 12th month so it's a unique day um, i'm very happy to introduce my good old friend uh, ramanujam who has been associated with the mathematics popularization and communication throughout india and abroad and was serving as a faculty in the institute of mathematical sciences uh, chennai he is a phd from tata institute of fundamental research and he belongs to the theoretical computer science group of the institute of mathematical uh, sciences he is acti actively involved in as i said math popularization as well as uh, math communication uh, through the uh, tamil nadu science forum Uh, in which he is a very active uh, member and uh, we had formally met in a similar conference in chennai a couple of years ago uh, in dealing with creative mathematical sciences communication and that's an international forum where it is still going on 2022 uh, event is going to be held in april in i think uh, sweden if i am correct uh, and then math communicators meet how to communicate mathematics to the society at large will the society need mathematics at all so these are the themes that we discuss uh, how to popularize mathematics uh, professor ramanujam will talk about these things uh, in detail and today's uh, topic is a very catchy and uh, relevant topic uh, because it deals with mathematics for democracy and now democracy is the strongest form of uh, governance that's what people believe so so democracy is needed if not we have seen what what will happen if there is no democracy so the role played by mathematics in such uh, popular themes has to be made aware uh, to the students at large so i have great pressure to invite uh, professor ramanujam to give his talk on mathematics for uh, democracy thank you vijay kumar sir without further ado we'll move on to the lecture i kindly request other participants to keep their mic on mute during the talk we will have an interactive session after the talk so please maintain the decorum i welcome professor ramanujan and re uh, respectfully extend the floor to you sir thank you thank you very much uh, now of course uh, it will be a great pleasure if uh, at least a few people can keep their videos on so i have some faces to talk to but uh, i know how this whole thing is during this pandemic we have all got used to talking to our laptops and uh, it will be nice if i can see some people that i can talk to but yeah okay. so thank you very much uh, i i for this uh, very kind introduction for this invitation it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this forum i have already congratulated uh, dr vinod kumar on this uh, excellent and resourceful team of uh, students who are uh, uh, very active and are uh, doing uh, uh, very creative work in popularizing mathematics among the student community it's a great pleasure to meet you all and i hope i'll get to meet you all sometime in uh, uh, ernakulam and other places in kerala as well and uh, it's great to also catch up with my old friends vijay and santosh and several like others here um, so thank you very much uh, so yeah thanks to dr vinod kumar professor vijay ambath and the maths ecstasy, ecstasy team for the invitation Uh, do feel free to interrupt with questions anytime i mean it's uh, 
said in a kind of ritualistic fashion, but I do mean it. I do not mean it as just a formality. It would be very nice to have uh, comments and questions. And I do expect to ask questions and I would like uh, people to respond to them as well. Okay, so um, I must confess that uh, the title, as was indicated, uh, uh, is more catchy than it should be, really, because uh, I'm not going to talk about the broad idea of democracy. I mean, that's a huge theme, right? So I'm going to talk about something much, much more specific, namely elections, right? Now, mechanisms for implementing elections are crucial for democracies, right? I mean, so if anything that you take seriously at all, you take the idea of free and fair elections as something uh, essential, a core of democracy, democratic practice. But if that is so, surely a formal theory of elections would be relevant. Now, I'm a logician. I identify myself as a logician, a theoretical computer scientist. But even within theoretical computer science, my mathematical interest tends to be the application of mathematical logic to problems that arise from computation. So, well, here is a procedure, right? Election is a social procedure. It's a grand procedure on a certain day. You know, everybody goes to vote. At the end of which, results are declared. And in India, it's nothing less than a festival, right? But what are the logical properties do we expect of this social procedure? What are the axioms, if you like, right? If I were to axiomatize, I mean, in mathematics, we axiomatize structures and then look at their properties based on those from them and then um, you know reason about structures based on uh, properties derived from axioms so what are the axioms of uh, elections right well something that you take for granted right only eligible voters should vote right i mean it would be bizarre if uh, an election would let anybody vote Okay, so, and eligible voters should vote, and they should vote at most once. In some societies, it's compulsory, so you will also say at least once. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that you expect as a property of elections. Confidentiality of votes. Well, you also assume that uh, a free and fair election should ensure confidentiality. If my vote is public, then I'm not going to feel comfortable voting at all. So only eligible voters vote and that their votes are confidential. Now, these are properties that you expect. Anything more? Does anyone have uh, any suggestions? Yeah, it's a question. So I would like some people to respond. Are there any other properties that you expect uh, from an election? You do want votes to be confidential. You do want only eligible voters to vote. Anyone? Sortability of the candidates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the candidates, well, no, this is a problem, right? Okay, this is probably a desirable property. We're going to have a problem defining uh, no foul play. Ah, this is very important, right? No. They should have proper education, like uh, what to... Physical to security vote. is a must. Proper education. Yes, Bhavya? Uh, yes, sir. Voters must be aware of the situation in uh -huh. the country. Okay. So now, I, as you can see, there are a lot of what you might call... Um, would you call eligibility of voters a necessary property or a desirable property? Desirable property. Desirable property. Yes, Do you think sir. an election where an act, it's desirable means what? There is a difference between necessary property and desirable. Necessary property. property. Ah, necessary property means if that doesn't hold, you have to declare the election null and void, right? So if vote now eligibility of voters is considered an essential property, confidentiality of voters is considered an essential property. It's a necessary property. In the sense that uh, now almost all societies will have a whole bunch of desired properties like uh, the 
things that were mentioned just now about representation of different communities, only desirable candidates, education, whatever that means, many, you know, what about no foul play? Now that sounds like a necessary property. How are we even going to define these things? Right? Now, if you want to mathematize these things, so right now I'm going to be even more narrow. Okay, I'm already going from democracy to elections. And from elections, I'm going to be even more narrow. I'm going to concentrate on necessary properties, right? I don't even worry about, you know, unsuitable guys getting elected, which we see. Several communities not uh, being represented. And right to vote is exercise for sure. But, uh, you know, many, many things and so on. But what about... Now, if you start thinking about a theory of elections, uh, you realize that there is much more. For instance, this is a property that you want, universal verifiability. It says that every caste vote has actually been counted, right? Just because, you know, vote, is ca vote has been cast, only eligible voters cast their vote, and votes are confidential, doesn't mean that every vote that has been cast has been actually counted in declaring that. Now, if it turns out that a whole lot of votes were never counted, it's a very serious problem because that changes the outcome of the election, right? Okay, so this is a necessary property. Now, some people would argue that you also want individual verifiability. That means, now, if you're talking about right to your franchise as being, you know, fundamental in a democracy, you should say, well, every voter can check that her vote has been counted. You know? Do I have the right to check whether my vote is actually counted or not? Right? Well, again, uh, you can have theories where people argue that this is a necessary condition, you know, you know, desirable condition, etc. Et no summaries. This is absolutely essential. Partial results should not be available until all voters have voted. I mean, think about the recent elections in West Bengal, right? Where we had an eight phase election. Yeah, eight phases. So if by the end of the third phase, you know, people can already know how the results are going. It will, of course, uh, influence the rest of the election. Right? Any election that has a certain duration, there is always this very important issue. And I am only talking about implementing elections here. And this is, uh, again, an essential condition. The last one is not obvious, what is called received freeness. Okay. Now, this is what I think only a logician would come up with, but uh, it's actually very reasonable after you're told. What is this? No voter should be able to prove to another how he or she voted. At the end of the election, I should not be able to come and tell you, look, I actually voted for this party, and here is proof that I voted for. Why is that a problem? Suppose people can do that, what will go wrong? Suppose somebody, some X can actually prove to Y that he voted for a particular party. What will be a problem? Anyone? If such proofs are possible, it opens the ground immediately for coercion. Some party can come and tell me that either you prove at the end of the election, come and prove that you actually voted for me, otherwise I'll break your legs, right? Well, could lead to conflict is, you know, very serious problem is that somebody can say, I'll break your legs if you have not voted for me, right? Threats, coercion is a major problem. Bribery, of course, is a problem, right? You come and prove to me that you voted for me, I'll give you so much money. But in any case, in India, even without such proofs, uh, you know, money is uh, very much part of the scenario. But in any case, yeah. So uh, people have argued that receipt readiness is a very important uh, uh, thing of elections. Why am I even talking about it in today's context with all these things put together in a particular form of mathematization? That's because if we start thinking about electronic voting, right? For elections. Electronic voting is something that is coming up. Uh, but I don't mean VBPAT machines which we use. That's not electronic voting. That's only registering 
machines. I'm talking about the entire selection election system with online or you know you go and vote and then at the end of it. Now Estonia has already been having electronic voting for its general elections. So uh, that's the first that is the first country to introduce. By now about four countries have started. Several states in the US have been discussing. Uh, there is a discussion going on in the world. I don't know where it's going to go, but uh, because of the pandemic in India also, there were discussions last year about possibilities of electronic voting. These problems become particularly acute if you start thinking about electronic voting. If you're going to trust the software um, and hardware, whatever hardware, software uh, for registering votes, counting them, collecting them and declaring the winner. And I'm only talking, think about it. I'm only talking about the mechanism of democracy, a very simple procedure an algorithm, so to speak, followed by society to announce certain candidates at a particular time, collect votes and declare the winner. It's a very simple algorithm that societies have been practicing. And that algorithm you consider as a way of, as, you know, understanding democracy, right? But you have many, many issues. Okay. Suppose you take all these properties. Now, I have put a list of uh, six properties, uh, one, two here, eligibility and confidentiality. And I have put in uh, four here, six properties, right? Now, when you write down six properties, a good mathematical question to ask, is this set of properties even consistent? Right? I mean, this is the first logical question that you ask. I make, suppose I say an election must necessarily satisfy all these six properties, right? Um, are they consistent? Can we even prove that all these requirements are logically consistent? There is another way of asking, can we even in principle run an election in which all these properties can be guaranteed? Okay. Now I'm asking this question, not so much for this particular set of six properties to make a point clear that if you had a formal mathematical theory of elections, this is the kind of question you should ask. You let down whatever your society, there is a social consensus. You come up with whatever properties that you think are essential. And then first step is prove that they are consistent, right? And then see how you can actually implement such an election. Well, here's the theorem. This is something that uh, uh, my former student, S.P. Suresh, who is a faculty member at CMI, uh, Bhaskar Anguraj, who is a faculty member in Bits Pilani Goa and I were working on and we could show that there is in fact no election procedure that, that guarantees all these properties together. They are logically inconsistent. I'm not going to go into proofs of this kind today because you know there is a certain uh, learning of formal mathematical logic that is needed and uh, consistency proofs are not uh, easy. But uh, this is really the logician's work. Right? On the other hand we can show that if you give up either universal verifiability or individual verifiability, then there exist election procedures that assure all the rest. Okay. So what we are saying is that all the six properties are together inconsistent, but uh, you can throw out one of these and you can get uh, you know, consistent procedures. Again, these are mathematical statements, right? I mean, in principle, there exist election procedures. Um, very, very far from, uh, going from there to even a particular electronic voting scheme or a physical voting scheme in a large scale election. But point is that uh, if you are talking about, uh, I'm here today to say that if you're going to take these democratic processes seriously, I think you should be looking at a mathematical theory of these, right? And if you start mathematizing these things, you know, for, you know, there are various ways. And as a logician, I feel that there are certain questions that one must ask from a logical point of view, which you can answer and at least understand them mathematically while you look at uh, what society is actually doing, right? Now, of course, here is an either or. Which would you rather give up? Now, here is where political theorists would uh, have very different answers, right? One school of political thought would say, you know, um, it's okay. Universal verifiability is important. You can give up and give up. Some other school of political thought would say, no, that's much more important, etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm not even talking about probabilistic statements, the, you know, something else after that. So just to give you a flavor of this kind of work, right? And I think this kind of work is possible. 
and by the way i am also assuming some very interesting things like i am talking about it in the context of cryptographic protocols where you use encryption assumptions to um, take care of confidentiality all these things so uh, cryptography doesn't guarantee you know security in an election in any particular way so i am assuming what is called a perfect encryption assumption so that uh, and you can even bring in algebraic properties of uh, encryption uh, encryption schemes into this kind of discussion so okay so this is one point i wanted to make so yeah such require such proofs require doesn't uh, individual verifiability imply universal verifiability not necessarily because i may actually so this is the trouble with things like encryption i may be able to convince you individually that your vote was counted right each person individually right but you know so for instance i uh, convince 40 people at a time right and then um, but then another 40 is vote is not counted right now i go uh, remove these people's votes and uh, show hey so it's uh, so these things are not independent actually so if somebody is out to cheat they can cheat in very fancy ways right and remember we are only constructing counter example scenarios right nobody is actually saying that somebody might actually do it or not this is the point about mathematical arguments yeah. good question any other uh, question one point of what i'm trying to do is to sell you mathematical logic right that you must learn mathematical logic to yeah okay thank you um, well we just started so we have some more to go okay so this is all about i have only talked about the procedural aspect of elections so far and there is also this philosophical question that vijay raised namely i mean you want a desirable person i I'm, i'm not even going to touch that issue right who's a suitable person right but let's look at a second question i'm only you know today talking about fairly mechanical things right name the first one is i'm not even talking about the rule that you use to elect from the votes right you have got all these votes how do you go from the votes to declaring the winner right that's one and then of course the candidate themselves okay so maybe towards the end i'll say something about the candidate themselves but not even into that what about the very purpose of election in a democracy right it is supposed to represent the will of the people right but can we understand this in any formal sense right uh now this is a big question there are big answers people have been thinking about this for a long time but let's take it in a very very simple way right i'm let me get in the most sim not simple simplistic way right suppose i can look into the minds of all the voters right let's not worry about that part in principle suppose i could take the you know there are some candidates let's say a b and c right if i know in the minds of all the voters everybody's preferences over a b c right for instance i find that bhavya has a preference a b c rabin has a preference c b a vijay has a preference uh, b a c etc etc for all at the right say cba and so right every single person preferences from there somehow i can say ah given the preferences of all that's that's the will of the people right can i come up with a function that takes this preference vector for all the voters and say this is the winner what would be the properties of that function this is a mathematical question to us right you understand the point right suppose there are three voters there will be a three vector for every voter every voter will say 1 1 2 3 to say this is my order 2 3 1 3 2 1 whatever right it's an ordered triple that comes from every vector right now and that's a finite list there are n voters i have a set this 3 power n uh, well yeah and uh, now i have to take these votes and declare the winner that's a function right that function takes all these uh, triples for n voters and will tell you yeah uh, who's the winner now 
every election is applying such a function. Question is, what functions do you consider reasonable? Once again, my thing of interest. What are necessary properties of such functions? Right? Can we prove they are consistent, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, suppose I talked about preferences, right? When I give a ranking, I'm expressing my preference. If you prefer A over B, right? Somehow I'm taking individual preferences and I'm deriving group preferences, right? Now, what are the properties of group preferences? Is transitivity a reasonable property? That is the question. If you prefer A over B, and if you prefer B over C, it is reasonable to expect that you prefer A over C, right? Unless you are irrational in some way, right? Rationality means that if you prefer A over B and then B over C, you prefer A over C. What about groups of people? Well, here is preference for three persons. Person one has the preference vector A, B, C. Person two says B, C, A. Person three says C, A, B. Now, a majority prefer A over B. A majority prefer B over C, as you can see. But alas, only a minority prefer A over C. So this already tells you that majority voting is not a very good function to determine the will of the people. right? But majority is the most commonly used thing. I mean, remember in every room when we, something comes up for discussion, show of hands, majority says this, therefore this is the winner, right? I mean, majority has been the most commonly used form of, you know, aggregating group preferences from time immemorial, right? Pretty much, you know, you look at political theory, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at Sangam literature or whether you're looking at this thing. Majority voting is what people are thought to. But majority voting lacks the most fundamental property that we expect in our preferences, namely transitive. Sir, Already but in that you, case, uh, there is yeah. only one option for one person. We can't uh, have many options. Like no, in, no, I'm trying to say that's a more restrictive thing, right? I'm saying even if I know your complete preference, it's a problem. Yeah, I agree yes. that uh, if it's binary voting, right? I mean, I just have one vote, right? Yes, sir. I mean, even if the, when you are binary voting, what you are talking about, right? You are only saying A over B, B over A, etc., right? So transitivity never comes up as a picture, right? If there are only transitivity, of course, is a is an issue when there are three alternatives or more. Yes, Bhavya, transitivity doesn't is not an issue at all if there are only two, right? Transitivity makes sense only when there are at least three elements in your set. So I agree with you that uh, if there are only two choices, show of hands is enough. But unfortunately, we pretend as if it's the same thing that happens even if there are multiple choices. That is my point. Right? It's also true. What you said is true that what I said from time immemorial, people have always used. Typically, they employ it in binary voting, but not always. And more often than not, there are third choices available. You don't even present the third choices or fourth choices or fifth choices simply because you present it as a binary choice. I mean, this part of politics. Right? So, okay. so my point is that uh, how does this work from the candidate's perspective? Okay. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Thanks, Sri Devi, for that. Um, I am not going to get into candidate's perspective in today's talk at all. In fact, like I said, I mean, these are very important questions to ask. Maybe we can take it up towards the end. I am only now going to focus on this question of the will of the people. And my point is that even in a situation where you have complete information about voters, is there a mathematical function, not a, but a class of functions that represent this will of the people? And how do I axiomatize them and study them? That's my more narrow focus today. But towards the end, I'll. Uh, discuss some of these issues as well. But these are important. So what's now comes the question. I said if you are rational, transitivity is something I assume, right? That if you prefer A over B and B over C, rationality demands that you prefer A over C. But what's the rationality of preferences? How do I even how about axiomatizing what a rational person would do? Right? If 
a preference structure, a preference relation, if you were to think of an ordering relation on a set, right? What are the properties that the preference relation should have? I mean, which mobile phone to buy? Factors, price, how cool it looks. These are all things that I got from students when I was sitting in. Now, all of these can be thought of as your uh, preference relation on the phones available in the market, right? You, when you are thinking of it, you have a particular preference relation in your head. In this case, a finite set. I'm going to only look at finite sets. And like I said, very reasonable to expect transitivity on this. And usually preference is not total, right? That means what? You don't have a, an n vector if there are n elements, right? Because some things you are indifferent. I, it's not that I have, you know, uh, maybe you might say that I, I don't, really don't care whether Samsung or Sony or whatever, right? right? So you are indifferent between options. So there will be incomparable elements. And, or you might say they are equivalent. Right? Now, again, whatever I am going to say will work for partial orders, but I'm going to keep things simple. I'll assume tot total order. So I'm, when I say preference relation, I'm, I'm not going to talk about total orders in which any two elements are ordered and there is actually a vector, right? N vector among N things. Okay, just for simplicity. So now, oh, I think I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is what we are really uh, asking. If, yeah, so let me go over to the majority rule. Sorry, uh, I should just skip. yeah. Now, if not majority rule, would you, what rule would you employ to infer group preferences from individual preferences? You might say the entire group prefers A over B if two thirds in the group prefer, uh, unless two thirds prefer B over A, right? If I know that two thirds prefer B over A, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'm happy with group preference being A over B. Here's one rule. What about dictatorial? Group preference is determined by a specific individual preferences. This is very, very common. We leave it to our great Talaiver. If Talaiver says, right, if our head, our uh, the head of the party is uh, this, you know, tasked with the choice, and if the high command says uh, A over B, that is the group preference of A over B over whatever options. Now, again, more common than we think. Somehow you want to say, choose the most common preference in the group. Another way is to look at a kind of frequency ranking, right? And say, okay, how many people prefer A over B? How many people prefer A over C? How many people prefer A over D? How many people prefer B over C? Find all these. And you take the majority in that. Another thing that, uh, by the way, whatever I'm talking about comes from political theory. If you go into political science textbooks, this is the, these are all the sort of things that I discussed in the, under various names. And, and Well, minimize dissatisfaction. This is something that's very important in politics, right? Minimize the number of individuals whose preference is opposite to what you decide for the group. If your function says A over B, right, finally, the group preference is A over B, you should not find that a majority actually saying B over A, right? You want to minimize the number of individuals. So you may not make everybody happy, but you want to make sure that you make as few people unhappy as possible. <coughs> now, I'm mentioning these rules not to sell any of these rules. Let me make it clear. I'm only giving you rules which as I said, political theorists have talked about, which can be mathematized very easily, you know, because these are all easy to write down as axioms or, you know, properties of your functions. So all these are ad hoc. I mean, for a logician, can I come up with a bunch of properties, bunch of axioms from which I can derive the others, right? I mean, this is very important, right? And it's, a, it's better to list desirable properties of inferred group preference and look for ways of constructing them, satisfying these properties. So you don't come up with individual rules. You don't come up with preference uh, functions. 
you know, these so-called aggregation functions, which take individual preferences and come up with a rule for deriving group preference. Instead of deciding a particular rule, much better way, and this is what social choice theory is about, is to say, you know, list the properties that we want and then ask what class of functions satisfy these properties. So here is a uh, term that is used in social theory, named after this Italian thinker, Pareto, who suggested this is the most important and fundamental necessary one. What is that? If everyone in the group unanimously prefers A over B, the, the group preference should say A over B. Right? It sounds completely absurd that if everyone is actually saying A over B and somehow your function has come up with a B over A. Uh, yes, Bhavishri, yeah, please ask. I see a hand raised. Sir, you, you have any question? I think by mistake. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Then lower the hand. We are done. Okay. So that's Pareto. Transitivity, I have already said. This is something that, uh, I mean, if you drop transitivity, it's very hard to construct functions, right? I mean, this is one of the you know, very, very difficult things to do. And another, uh, this is called independence of irrelevant alternatives. What is that? And by the way, the term profile is used for this vector, right? My ranking is ABC. Vijay's ranking is BCA. Bhavya's ranking is CAB, right? So these ve vectors are called profiles in the literature. This is from political theory, not my term. So if two profiles agree on a pair of choices, what is that? What do I mean? Supposing in my vector, I have written A, B, C, right? Uh, that means I prefer A over B. Vijay says C, A, B, right? Now, he also prefers A over B. Between A and B, both Vijay and I agree completely, right? Now, the, what we are saying is that if two profiles agree on a pair of choices, then the group, group references derived from them also agree on that pair. That means what, So, I mean, uh, take it contrapositively, it's much easier to understand. Suppose you have declared, right, from the individual preferences somehow I've figured out that the group actually prefers A over B, right? Now, it should not be the case that I add some more profiles, right? Which agree on that. Supposing I add, you know, for I have 10 profiles and I have come up with a you know, group function. Now I add uh, two more uh, them. Those two have said nothing about A over B, right? On A over B, they agree, right? But they differ on C and D, right? Just because I have added some irrelevant alternatives, which differ on C over D, my decision over A B, over B should not be affected. And this is a common sense thing that you would expect, right? By, by adding more voters whose preferences agree on the final outcome, I should not change the uh, outcome. Right? This is an informal way of presenting. So this is called independence of irrelevant alternatives. This is something that has been discussed since the 19th century. And of course, you know, so like Pareto, this is something again, everyone has uh, discussed at length. There is no single individual whose preference unilaterally determines the group preference. You cannot find a single voter such that if that voter prefers A over B, then the group declares A over B. So uh, this is, I am now presenting it in one slide, these four principles. These four principles were extensively debated, especially in Europe, post-French Revolution, political theory in various contexts and so on. And by mid 20th century, I would say that these were the kind of uh, rules that were considered necessary for any function that derives group preferences, if even assuming complete 
knowledge of individual preference. Assuming that you know the vectors for all the voters, assuming that they actually have a total order, if you know all of these things, if you, even if you, with all that, if you come up with a function, that function must satisfy these four properties. What are the four properties once again? Pareto says if there is a unanimous decision to prefer A over B, then so does the group. Group cannot go against the will of the consensus on particular candidates. So therefore, if you have a problem, majority is already a problem, right? Well, or maybe not. Yeah. Non-dictatorial. There is no single individual, right? Transitivity and then independence of irrelevant alternatives. Look at it always as adding some vectors, right? If with 10 vectors, I've come to a decision and I add two vectors, which do not differ on the particular decision, but add some other uh, variations that does not affect the decision over the 12. So here is Kenneth Arrow, who came up with a remarkable theorem in this context in 1953. He got the Nobel Prize for economics later, economics of information where uh, he did a lot of work, a very influential figure from Stanford. His PhD dissertation in 1951, Arrow's theorem is a cornerstone for this kind of area. Okay. It says that in any group of at least three individuals, any assignment of group preference satisfying Pareto, transitivity, and IAA is necessarily dictatorial. dictatorial. So in my term, it will be like saying all those four axioms together are inconsistent. You can't have a preference uh, group preference function, social choice function, as it's called. You can't have a social choice function that satisfies all the four axioms. Now, if you give up one of them, and that's what he actually took up, if you give up a dictatorial, then you do have. And it's a beautiful proof. It says that if you actually satisfy those three, it must necessarily be dictatorial. Uh, what we'll do is to see a proof outline for Arrow's theorem, but not in Arrow stuff, because I want to change things. A little bit. I would say this is one of the most influential theorems of uh, economic theory modern times and uh, it actually led to the development of so-called social choice theory and whatever i'm talking about broadly is under the class social choice theory and uh, arrow's theorem is what led to the bulk of the research now a beautiful introduction to social choice theory is amartya sen's book in 1970 and uh, i would say that uh, sen's presentation is perhaps uh, you know, much, it's also more powerful in many ways because uh, you know, it looks at notions of development based on these and choices that societies exercise. And here is Amartya Sen, another Nobel Prize winner in economics for pretty much working on the same thing, actually. Sen's theorem is taking Arrow's theorem forward and that's what he got the Nobel Prize for. So uh, I'm going to present uh, Sense version of Arrow's theorem, actually. And I'll give you a proof outline. And uh, But like in all mathematics, when somebody else gives you a proof, uh, you know, you can almost never understand the proof that somebody else gives. You have to work through the proof yourself at some point, right? But I hope I can still give you a flavor of the kind of arguments. Very, very simple mathematics. You know, secondary school is more than enough. Uh, and uh, so here is a uh, proof, okay. So call a coalition decisive. I'm going to use only words. I'm not going to even use symbols, use formal, to just give you the intuitive idea. So we call a group decisive, right? Uh, if everyone in G prefers A over B, so does the outcome. G is a subset, right? So if you have this entire set of individuals N, a group or a coalition is a subset of the group. Now, you say this subset is decisive because whenever this group decides A over B, the whole outcome also decides that. Now, of course, the entire set of individuals is decisive. Now, Arrow's theorem follows immediately if I prove the following lemma. This is called a contraction lemma. What is that? If G is decisive, 
where the size of size of g is greater than or equal to 2 then there exists a subset strict subset g prime of g that is this is supposing i prove this lemma i claim arrow's theorem is done why why am i done can somebody tell me well as long as i can prove that there exists a decisive group sorry yeah that's very important yeah now why does there exist a decisive group the whole group n is decisive right according to this lemma i apply this lemma i come up with at least n minus 1 if n minus 1 happens to be greater than or equal to 2 i apply the lemma keep going what will happen at some point i'll hit 2 if 2 it applies right therefore i apply the lemma and i get 1 that's dictatorial a group of 1 that is decisive is exactly what you call a dictatorial so arrow's theorem proving arrow's theorem comes to proving the contraction lemma so if you can prove the contraction lemma you don't even have to prove the existence of a decisive group because you know there is one that you can start with so on any finite set of voters right and so this is all that is needed now how do you hope to prove the contraction lemma right well i started with the group g i know that g is at least greater than or equal to 2 right so what i can do is i can partition g into g1 and g2 what's a partition a partition of a set is think of it as dividing it into subsets such that their union is original set and the intersection is non empty that's a partition yeah so i partition the set to g1 and g2 both are non empty such that one of the two is almost decisive now what is almost decisive okay that's a definition that i need i say that g is almost decisive whenever everyone in g prefers a over b and everyone outside the group prefers b over a then the outcome prefers a over b so decisive says g is decisive if i am g my preference a over b dictates the outcome this one says it's almost decisive means when i have come to a situation where everybody within my group prefers a over b and it's also the case that everyone outside the group has a contradictory preference a over a in that case the outcome prefers a over b I mean, these are abstract ways of thinking about it, right? Remember, we are not talking about any particular function. Right? This is what is very critical in this whole theory. I am not taking a two-thirds majority. I am not taking any of those particular outcomes and talking. I am saying any function that satisfies those conditions. Okay. Now, clearly, every group is decisive. If it is decisive, it's almost decisive. And what is surprising and revealing. is that we can show that the converse is true as well okay <coughs> so let's first do this uh, and we will worry about that later how do we do this contraction well first like i said that uh, i want to partition g into non empty g1 g2 such that one of the two is at almost decisive okay so how do we do that fixed choice is abc a profile uh, some profile such that over g1 we have the vector cab over g2 it is abc and outside it is bc okay so what am i saying so g over g1 i have a over b g2 also it is a over b but notice that both g1 and g2 agree on a over b whereas outside the group it is b over a that's important but then there is a c changing things in between because g1 and g2 are actually different because uh, of course everybody in g1 prefers a over b but they always see prefer c over all of these whereas g2 they all prefer a over b all right but uh, you know that preference is greater than 
both are preferred over C. Now, suppose G1 is not almost decisive. Now, by the independent of irrelevant alternatives, we can argue that the outcome prefers B over C. Right? Why? Because notice that in G2, there is B over C. And outside G is also B over C. Right? So my adding G1 is not going to make any difference. G1 is adding counter to that. So by G2 union G would actually decide B over C. So in fact, the whole outcome will prefer B over C. So G1 cannot be almost decisive. Now, suppose G2 is also not almost decisive. Right? Yeah. Then... Again, by independence of irrelevant alternatives, we can argue that the outcome prefers C over A because here is within G1, it's C over A. Outside G, it's C over A. So by independence of irrelevant alternatives, in fact, this G2 preference over A over C is immaterial. Right? So by transitivity, if the outcome prefers B over C and the outcome prefers C over A, you must have uh, outcome prefers B over A. B over C and this thing, you must you will have this. But G is decisive. We started with G that was decisive. Right? And here within G, you find everybody prefers A over B. Therefore, the outcome should prefer A over B. And that's a contradiction. So we assumed, if we assume that both G1 is at most, G1 is not almost decisive, and G2 is not almost decisive, I get a contradiction. Therefore, it must be the case that one of the two is almost decisive. Reduction ad absurdum proofs are always, uh, you know, a little bit tricky to get your head around. I wanted to prove that if you give me a set that is decisive, I can partition it into two non-empty set G1, G2, such that one of the two is almost decisive. What I do is to take G, that's a decisive set, and because it's now, why should I be able to find profiles G1, G2 such that I can do this? Well, that's a little bit uh, of a work to be done. But uh, I assure you that it's very straightforward. But once you split G into G1, G2, just an assumption that G1 is not almost decisive and G2 is not almost decisive gets a contradiction. And therefore, one of the two must be almost decisive. And so, now all I have to do is to show that any almost decisive group is actually decisive. So what have I now? I started with G and I've gone into strictly smaller subsets. Well, one of the two is almost decisive. If I prove that that is decisive, I have proved a contraction level because I've taken a decisive set and I've come up with a strictly smaller decisive set as long as the number is greater than or equal to two. Well, how do you prove this? This is called the field expansion lemma. It says, well, what do you need to show? Almost decisive means what? If uh, everyone in this group prefers G over X over Y. So we know that if everyone in the group prefers X over Y and outside the group, everyone prefers Y over X, then my decision will carry. X over Y will carry. I have to show that I can drop that other assumption about outside X over Y you know, y over x, right? So I need, to, I start with an almost decisive group. And now I have to show for any profile, for a, you know, whatever choices x, i, if everyone in the group prefers x over y, so does the outcome. Again, by independence of irrelevant alternatives, it's sufficient to show for a pair a, b, and profile r, i prime. Some, uh, I just add another profile which simply agrees with this A over B. It's only different on some C over D. Now, let's see B a third alternative. And what I do is to define that extra profile by saying over A and B do the same as my group R. And so you put A, C, B, right? I'm keeping A over B. Add some X, right? But outside, what do I do? I'll say that... Uh, uh, for all uh, other x, I'll put CAX and CBX. In the front. So two profiles I'll add outside. Now, since G is almost decisive, A is preferred over C. By Pareto, 
you will see that C is preferred over B, and hence A is preferred over B by transfer. So this is it. This last part I'm not going to go over again. Uh, Ajit Rajput has raised his hand. Any question, Raj? Ajit? Is there a question or is it a mistake? Okay. Niveda, was there a question? Okay. Fine. And so all these theorems suggest that determining group preferences from individual preferences is not easy. And the simplest procedure used in democracies are elections, which follow a much simpler ranking rule, right? So one way is to say, oh, this is difficult, right? We simply ask the group members to give their preference rankings over alternatives. I don't care what their actual preferences are. And I simply apply a decision rule, right? And let's say that, okay, there is no perfect de decision rule. Let's just understand specific decision rules and ask what are the outcomes. And societies have used many different decision rules over centuries, and many mathematicians have studied properties of these rules. Uh, in the 18th century, there were there was work by Condorcet uh, and Borda, which you know started off, I must say, a whole lot of this way of thinking about things. In 19th century, there was Charles Dodson, who did some splendid analysis of uh, election rules. And 20th century, I've already mentioned uh, Kenneth Arrow, then uh, Satith White, several mathematicians. And, uh... By the way, does that name sound familiar? Does anyone know who I'm referring to? The 19th century mathematician called Charles Dodson. Alice in Wonderland. Exactly. Yes, Gia. <laughs> this is Lewis Carroll, and people know his name is Lewis Carroll. So that was a clip, you know, a vicar, in fact, uh, who did some very interesting mathematics. So, uh, I mean, and it almost fits the personality of uh, someone who wrote Alice in Wonderland, right? I mean, he looked at all kinds of questions mathematically, you know, elections, uh, plants, how plants flower, all sorts of things. And uh, so his mathematics was highly eccentric and original. And he loved puzzles. And, you know, and here is Marquis de Condorcet. And as I said, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, I don't know. It's also interesting that he is a Marquis. And uh, he was deeply inspired by the French Revolution. And uh, what he was really interested in asking what do these things mean mathematically? Liberty, equality, fraternity, all these things. And he was led to these kind of uh, thoughts on elections. And here is. Jean Charles de Borda. So, and, uh, and here he's looking at uh, astrolabe. Uh, Borda, you know, was really interested in the properties of the solar system. And uh, some of his work led to the great Poincare conjecture. And then, so, Borda was again, uh, you know, so these were all mathematicians, mathematicians who had very, very broad views of mathematics. I mean, they were never bothered by algebra, analysis, geometry, you know, these kind of boundaries, right? So, and that's why they could also think about things like elections and so on. So we all know the first past the post system, which we all follow. And uh, here are some very famous one round election rules, right? And uh, plurality, what is plurality rule? Each voter avoids one, you know, awards one point to her top alternative and the one with the most points wins. And this is the one that is used in all polit political elections. Like today, when you go to vote, this is what you do. You vote for whoever you consider, I hope, yeah, the best candidate. You vote for one candidate. And so your vote counts for one for that particular candidate. For every candidate, you look at how many votes are got. Whoever gets the maximum, you declare the winner. So this is plurality. This is what we use in India in uh, general elections. Then there is Borda count. So Borda's uh, thing, if we have M alternatives, each voter awards uh, award, awards m minus k points to his kth ranked alternative. That means what? I award five points 
right? Suppose there are five candidates, right? Whoever is my topmost preference, I give five, five points. Whoever is my second preference gets four. Third preference gets three, right? And so on. So the one with the most points wins. And this is, in fact, is the system used today in the national elections of Slovenia. I've been to Slovenia in Ljubljana. I used to talk. I, in fact, uh, I gave some lectures in Ljubljana and I was asking students and faculty how they felt about this. And they very strongly defend the board account, right? So you never actually vote for a single person, right? You vote for people in some particular order. Of course, you need not vote for everybody. And you may decide to give everybody a zero, but you actually award points uh, between uh, one and n, where n is the number of candidates. And uh, um, and I believe it's not only in Slovenia, but Slovenia is a very large country with this uh, system. Then there is veto. Uh, it's a veto. It's from the Latin word, where each alternative count the last placed votes. And the ones with the least of them wins. Okay, this is the minimizing dissatisfaction idea. What what is the idea? For let's say there are three candidates A, B, C. You see who are all who all got the least number of votes, right? Right. And uh, okay, yeah. So, so this is assuming that everybody gives their preference. So you look at for voter one, who is the last place candidate, for voter two, last place candidate, and so on. So you can think of these as negative votes, right? Who all got negative votes, and so you are allowed to vote against, right? So I can say that I am not interested in voting for, but I'm interested in voting against. I don't want this party to vote. So this is my negative vote. So you count all negative votes, and whoever got the least negative vote uh, will win. Then these are multiple round elections, and this is called a single transferable vote. And this is used in, uh, like I've written, Ireland, Malta, Australia, New Zealand, and many places, STV. There are M minus one rounds for M candidates. In each round, you do a regular runoff. Whoever is the last is eliminated. And then you have a runoff between the remaining ones. Whoever is the last is eliminated. Keep doing that until you get a winner. And uh, for instance, the French use this for uh, presidential elections. Not up to this, they use a certain criterion that's in between, and then they use a runoff. And then say that, you know, next round, whoever remains. So somebody gets eliminated in each round and you keep pushing up. And plurality with runoff, okay? In the first round, two, okay, I'm sorry, this is what I, so two alternatives with the highest plurality won't survive. In the second round, the winner of a pairwise election between these two alternatives becomes the final winner. And this is the French presidential elections follow this way. They don't use this for the parliamentary elections, but only for the presidential elections. Then there is a Condorcet winner. Interestingly, Condorcet, as I said, initiated this whole theory. As far as I know, I don't think any national elections follow the Condorcet system, which is very complicated uh, to implement. But almost all political theorists agree that the Condorcet rule is probably the fairest of them all, right? Because it says conduct pairwise elections, right? And then the winner is one who beats every other alternative in a pairwise election. That is, A is elected. If I consider a hypothetical election between A and B, A will win. A and C, A will win. A and D, A will win, right? So you're not really into So anyone who can win again. So now, supposing I had a complete preferences, the vectors for all candidates, I can actually run such elections, just given the preferences, and you can. So what Condorcet wanted was an electoral system where every voter gives a ranking of all the candidates. You collect all the ranking, and from there, you run hypothetical elections between pairwise, and you will have M minus one hypothetical elections, and whoever beats every other one is the winner. Now, a Condorcet winner may not exist because you may not have a person who, in which case Condorcet would say, you must run, rerun the whole election. Right? You have multiple rounds of elections until one winner emerges. Now, again, there is no theoretical guarantee that such a winner will emerge at all. 
So you say a role is Condorcet consistent if if it elects the Condorcet winner if it one exists. Okay. So since that is too complicated, you can ask whether you know. So um, here is a Copeland rule. This is actually used again in some uh, committee elections in many parts of the world. So the score of a candidate is the number of candidates she beats in pairwise elections, and the one with the highest score wins. Uh, this is Max Bin, uh, an idea from for Neumann. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay, I'm not going to go into these. So this is what uh, Dodson or Lewis Carroll proposed. So he actually came up with the distance function between preference profiles. Is you ask. You know, between two profiles, how many swaps are needed to go from one to the other? And the number of swaps becomes a distance function. It's a metric in the classical sense. You know, it satisfies the triangular inequality. All sorts of things is there. So you can have a geometric presentation of these things. Okay. So um, I am going to give you uh, a table. What is this? There are. Uh, 49, 52, 60, yeah, 100 voters, right? This is a hypothetical election. There are five candidates, A, B, C, D, E, right? Now, these 100 voters have all been asked to give preferences, their complete ranking. 33 voters give the list as A, B, C, D, E. That means their preference ranking is A is on top, B is next, C is next, and so on. 16 voters give the preference B, D, C, E, A. Three voters give the preference C, D, B, A, E. Eight voters give C, E, B, D, A, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And that's it. There's nothing to the right, even though my table got translated. Now, plurality declares whom the winner. Can somebody tell me who's the winner according to plurality, according to our Indian general elections? Sir, A. A, because every, if you look at the top preferences, right, A gets the maximum top preference votes. So plurality declares A to be the winner. Okay. Uh, I hope there is no doubt about this, right? If I were to use the veto system, what is the veto system? Look at the least preferred, right? Among those who got the least. Okay. If you keep going down, right? Last place votes, yeah. A gets, uh, you know, uh, how many last place votes? 16. Uh, well, whatever, right? I mean, uh, of the 67, only three don't have. So 64, yeah. This is plurality is really nasty. Our election system is really nasty because 64 persons out of 100 place A as the least among the lot. But still, simply based on 33 votes, A wins the election. Right? So if you were to look at negative voting, 64 people would have said, I'm against this fellow. But simply because of relative preferences among others, A has moved to the top with just 33 votes. Right? So this Numerics here clearly indicates that there is a problem with plurality. Suppose I did Borda count. I'm not going to do this. I, uh, if somebody wants, you know, please take pictures of this table. Do with uh, all these. What will Borda count say? For 33 voters, A will get 5 points, B will get 4 points, C will get 3 points, D will get 2 points. So A is going to get 33 times 5, 16 times 1, 3 times 4, 8 times 1, 18 times 1, etc. That's what is the total border count for A. You do the count for B, you do the count for C, you do the count for D, you do the count for E. I give you a nice, this thing. I'm not going to tell you the answer. It's certainly not going to be A. Clearly, it's a different winner. That is you know, election two. It's the same numeric, same preferences for this population of 100 voters. On the other hand, if you were to do a Condorcet election, what will happen? You're going to look at how many, who 
if you were to have an election between only a and b who will win c 33 voters prefer a over b and everybody prefers b over a right clearly b beats a in this thing right what about c let's look at c c would be over a everybody c over a right and uh, yeah except 33 67 are going to say c over a what about c over b well except for uh, 16 uh, no 49 yeah okay 51 c over b okay that's again more than what about c over d c over d there is 16 against 18 34 so c beats d what about c over e well c over u you you find 33 49 52 more than 50 so c actually beats everybody else in a pairwise election so i am obviously writing 1 2 3 and going a b c so you should have in fact guessed that according to condor say c is the winner stv is much more complicated because you have to keep transferring the votes each time when you run off but if you do this you will find d is the winner and if you did plurality with run off you will find that e is the winner now what have i done i have given you the same vectors same numerics and i am telling you five rules all of which are based on sound theoretical principles and which most of them are actually used in national elections they declare different winners what does that tell you that tells you that the will of the people being implemented by these election rules by these decision rules of course i have you know come on i have tuned the numerics right i have picked the numbers in such a way that all these are illustrated right and uh, but uh, this is to tell you that it's not something as simple as a particular rule right some of these so uh, you know democracy is not about a particular election rule right i mean that's the fun important take home message i want to right it's the properties of these that are important lot more to think about but it cannot be reduced to some very simple things of this kind right but these functions are extremely important because we use them as mechanisms social algorithms in our life right so there are also for those interested in uh, algorithms some of these rules are complex and winners are hard to compute you can show that plurality and board account can be computed in polynomial time computing dots and winner is in fact np complete if you don't know what it is don't worry about it this is simply to say that's computationally hard you cannot expect you know even if algorithms exist you cannot expect to implement them in any algorithm uh, and in fact many restrictions on preference profiles are being studied okay there is a whole body of work and people have there is also beautiful theorems reg regarding manipulability so you say a rule is manipulable if there exists a profile where a voter can switch her preference from suppose ri is the profile i switch to ri prime such that whoever was my in my original profile ri right is that the one who wins what i mean is my preference is abc right for a variety of reasons i switch to acb to make sure that a will actually win i actually change the word for c to b i even check and change the word for a also so uh, gibbert's had it by theorem says that if a voting rule which has at least three possible outcomes and is non manipulable then it is dictatorial basically saying that every rule is manipulable if it is not dictatorial which is something you assume then uh, some element of manipulability is cannot be cannot be avoided and here complexity comes to the rescue what we can show is that manipulation is np hard that means what for somebody some small coalition to figure out that by their you know manipulating the outcome by, by switching preferences they can change the outcome but even compute which particular preferences they can change they'll have to do an exponential amount of uh, calculation so to speak okay. so this is a rich field 
let me end with saying that this is an area of intellectual endeavor that intersects philosophy, politics, and economics, and uses tools from mathematics and computer science. The mathematics involved is very simple, very simple algebra, very simple uh, combinatorics, and a uh, little bit of finite field theory I've seen used, but uh, you know, it's very simple. Main take home message is that societies cannot be rigid about voting rules. Social preferences are hard to derive, and the logical difficulties in doing so need to be acknowledged and addressed. There is a desperate need for formal logical theories of this kind. And with the advent of the internet and algorithms that make decisions, these considerations apply to a far wider variety of contexts than before. Thank you. My email is here. Anyone who wants to uh, take up these discussions can write to me. Sir, there is one question in the chat box. Ah, yeah. Sorry, I have not looked in the chat box. Uh, what might be the reason in India for not shifting to other ways of plurality in the right way? Large population is that when you are not educated, is there a relationship between the size of voters and the way? No. The election rule is uh, independent of the size of the voting population. Uh, I mean, as long as uh, that uh, thing is greater than three, right? And the number of voters is greater than three, number of candidates is greater than two, almost all these theorems apply. So those things don't matter very much. Of course, it's, uh, I agree that, uh, oh, that is my screen. Yeah. So I agree that uh, simplicity is a very important criterion, right? I mean, so plurality is the simplest thing, right? So if you think of what they do in Ljubljana or these uh, multiple rounds and multiple decision making, uh, that would be hard. So the, you know, there was a discussion in the 1940s. Uh, I, I think Zakir Uzayan again was the chairman of the committee that the Congress had to study some of these things. And uh, Jawaharlal Nehru wrote about this, in fact. And uh, Ambedkar wrote about this, and uh, the constitution makers were clear that uh, the simplest rule that you can use is the best, and uh, so they stuck to majority. So I think it's simply for uh, grounds of simplicity. But the discussion on proportional representation now, this is that is an interesting one. If you read the debates in the constituent uh, assembly uh, when they were drafting the constitution, whether uh, you should have uh, you know, in a party system, you should have proportional representation or simply first past the post. On that, there was again elaborate discussion. I think Ambedkar was very keen on proportional representation from what I remember. And, but uh, again, people felt that this would be too complicated and uh, in India it would lead to all kinds of problems, so they decided to stick with the first past the post. But uh, this is something that, yeah, political theorists would say proportional representation is better. And yeah, that's what I think uh, in terms of number of seats rather than uh, percentage, right? What is the proportional representation? That means if your party gets 33% of the votes, you get one third of the seats are allotted to you, right? Uh, not particular. And this is the kind of thing that has been tried. In Germany, this is the system that is followed different parts of the world use these. My point is that these are all things for democratic debate and very important debate is needed. Informed debate is needed. And in my opinion, mathematicians have a lot to contribute to these discussions as well. A clarifying something. That's about all I think. So which method of voting can give a result which is near to the most accurate result? Uh, is it really possible practically? Okay, there are two parts to one, your thing. What I've tried to show is that these negative theorems tell you that even in principle, there is no way to define and show the existence of a rule that gives the most accurate in the sense that you're talking about. So then you can settle for compromise. You can say, you know, you can talk to you about things that are epsilon close, approximability, all these things. And of course, mathematicians play that game. And then you can talk about what is But when it comes to practically, what do we mean in, you know, where millions of voters, I don't think, you know, uh, 
there is a sufficiently good theory. I mean, I, I find it very hard to talk about in practice without having a good theory because I'm a theoretician. So I find it uh, very difficult to actually say. But in political science, you do see discussions of this kind. And uh, but claims about what is practical or not, which I find hard to evaluate. Um, so basically, we can't really know. Raina Thomas says that prefer people's preference through a free and fair election because it's largely dependent on the mode of election, or is it that people must be educated so that they can collectively help a preferred candidate win by knowing the strategies of the chosen election? Okay. It's a beautiful question. So first point is never trust a single rule. Right. That's what we are saying. Right. But there's nothing that stops us from coming up with combinations of rules. Right. And that's also very, very interesting. Right. And we might say that among these rules that I'm considering, this is better. This is one. Second, like we talked about, is that, uh, you know, I have talked about it as if it's all individual voting. I have not even talked about coalitions. Right. Where we agree. Right. My preference may be over B. Your preference may be B over C, B over A, whatever. But we come together and say that for this purpose, we will all guarantee that we will vote A over B. Right? We make deals. Then everything changes. And notice that typically that's what happens in elections. Right? Now, but then on what basis to come up with a coalition? Coalition formation, coalition sustenance. These are very interesting and important questions. Now, I hope that on, if you can come together on ideological basis, Right. So you use the word strategies makes sense. So there are certain ways by which you can come up with strategies and, you know, drive the outcome in a particular way. And that's considered politically very good. Right. I mean, for instance, you say that, uh, OK, we take water as, you know, drinking water as a main issue. Right. So I say that I just rank candidates based on that. Right. So I can use multiple attributes to rank candidates and come up. So, yeah, Selva Kumar has pointed out that uh, it's closest to sta stable matching and so on. Yeah, there is, of course, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I can show you very nice uh, connections with Hall's theorems on perfect matching, right, and uh, stable matching and so on. But uh, <laughs> there is much more, I mean, much, much more, I must say, right? Uh, these are all with tremendous simplifications. But yes, you know, very, I told you broadly combinatorics, but specifically graph theory, if you are interested, I can show you nice connections. In fact, a whole lot of the work on algorithmic social choice theory is by translating many of these problems into graph theoretic issues or combinatorial issues and studying the complexity. Yeah. Um, Abhishek Mishra says, can we do a PhD in this topic? I think there is room for, you know, hundreds of PhDs in this topic in my opinion. So, uh, in India, there are a few people who are doing fascinating work. One of my colleagues in math science, Sushmita, who just joined uh, during the pandemic. She's been doing very, very nice work on this. There is uh, Nildhara in IIT Gandhinagar uh, who works on this. In IIT Madras, there are a couple of people. So uh, I think we have uh, maybe about uh, 10 to 15 persons now in India who are doing some of these things. And I mentioned my own former students and group. So there are, uh, but this is a very small number, right? And uh, very, very far from uh, doing formal theories of things. So, uh, uh, this is uh, may happen in that percentage of mass voter for party policy. Yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, the same point, right? Uh, proportionate representation would be far more representative than what we are doing. And that's certainly true. But uh, this is a matter of education. This is really a matter of education. I don't know whether in a billion population, how easy or difficult it will be to do. How does the presence of social media and the possibilities? Yeah. So uh, in terms of group, this is very important. And uh, I have not uh, talked about these issues at all. I said I have not talked about suitability of candidates that Vijay raised, many of these. Um, so. Um, something that uh, some of us are working on. There's a lot about, you know, so one of my work is in the theory of large games, uh, where you look at gameplay, you know, formal uh, games where uh, you have, uh, uh, let's say, 100,000 players, 
so with a population of 100 players let's say and you can talk about uh, player types uh, you know this is what the game theorists use so you can talk about influencers you can talk about followers you can talk about leaders and then you can ask what proportion of people in this can actually swing uh, one result of the game to another so using such techniques you can actually talk about uh, spread of influence you can talk about these and uh, it's it gets complicated so that's why i didn't want to get into that but it's certainly possible and in that sense you can mathematize the role of uh, influencers of some kind the mechanisms that they use for influencing is kind of outside the mathematization here but uh, what you can say is that if you hold certain ways of influencing how you can spread that and how that can swing something from you know profiles from one to the other certainly possible to mathematics but i was i'm here only talking about the baby steps other questions ah uh, there was also this beautiful question earlier about looking at this from candidates point of view yeah so again there are uh, game theoretic formulations and uh, christian list in london school of economics has been doing fascinating work on these and uh, list and petit have a book on this and uh, there was this mathematician who died 3 uh, months ago his name i towns towns has this uh, book on these uh, so basically what are your incentives why do you why do candidates lie <laughs> that's a question that yeah i mean especially when there is a chance that of you are getting caught he's really looking at american elections and these and he did a fascinating analysis and uh, people have looked at some of these you know how what, how candidates can present issues in such a way that will swing the profiles of voters from one to the other and what are the things that you can do and people have tried to come up with mathematical theories of these uh, i must say that most of these are uh, very very naive but uh, simplistic but you have to begin somewhere and what is heartening as i said is that a very small amount of algebra combinatorics graph theory you can make you know you can actually understand a lot <laughs> that uh, and but of course i I, should, i must also warn you that formalization comes with many many problems right i mean there are great limitations to formalization political theory is much deeper the philosophy is much deeper one must you know look at it from that uh, with that bit of humility i think it's very important for when you mathematize anything especially social issues because uh, social theories are highly ambiguous but on the other hand much richer my hope is that this interplay between formalization and the philosophical depth uh, and influencing each other and learning from each other can lead to uh, better solutions or at least this is very important that you know people who are ultra clever who know so much mathematics and computer science and so on will rather than simply contributing to the revenues of google and microsoft and thinking of that as the greatest employment opportunity will think of problems of society and uh, you know think about finding solutions to them ultimately i think that's what i'm hoping for yeah as uh, any committee try to convince the person the politicians that this method is not mathematically correct the percent election method uh, yeah so uh, proportionate representation is something that like i said you know it goes back all the way to the uh, jawarlal nehru zakir hussain malnobis you know after all uh, many people so i think there was a very early uh, recognition that proportionate representation would be much better than the first past the post but the objection was that it would be too complicated it would be hard to even inform the electorate right that uh, so this has come up several times and i think uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago there was again a discussion of that kind but uh, as far as i know it has remained pretty much there saying that uh, uh, it would not be possible for people to understand what's going on that the electorate is not educated enough to 
appreciate proportionality. Because what you, for instance, think about it, you'll have to say that uh, if 33%, if your party got 33% of votes, right, you get 33, one third of the seats in, par in assembly, let's say. But one third of the seats means which constituencies will you get? Now, constituency-based representation will have to go. Or let's say that you would say at constituency-wise. So there are many choices to be made. Now, the Germans have come up with one solution. Now, in India, coming up with a solution at a national level to these seem to be so difficult that I think the politicians don't even want to go there. But uh, it is everybody acknowledges it's a problem. I think all the political parties also agree that this is a silly thing, what's going on. They also suffer from the same electoral arithmetic right that uh, they get uh, percentage of votes they get much more and still lose the election so people do feel mm -hmm. it's a problem but uh, the scale seems to be daunting yeah. but so incidentally, right now for me yeah, i think yeah, we don't even have good academic discussions on these right I mean, yeah yes vijay sorry uh, recently there was a malayalam movie yeah. uh, about uh, in fact a political uh, movie by name one, wherein uh, the uh, chief, I mean the chief minister, brings in the right to recall. Okay, this issue was discussed by the producers, script writers, <laughs> along with uh, law lawmakers, uh, Supreme Court judges, and all that. Can we have a right to recall when you find that uh, some representative is not performing his duty? As a voter, do we have the right to recall him? And put him put somebody else. And the story of the movie says that uh, the chief minister who moved this resolution in the assembly could not win the votes. But after a few years, the same person becomes chief minister and then passes the law. That is the uh, that is the movie. Uh, so we, whatever be the uh, the method of election, if we have a right to recall, I think uh, some problem can be sorted out. Um, yeah, right to recall an individual or a party you know, or a whole individual, party. individual. Okay, there is again the difference. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So if I don't where like the MLA, I can pull him, uh, put him back, call him back. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, sir, uh, Santosh here. Um, so right to recall exists in many societies in the world. In many, uh, there are many nations in the world where uh, there is a right to recall. Yes, Santosh. Yeah, somebody. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, can we can we just, uh, think, uh, like this? Let the elections uh, go uh, as as we do. But uh, can we do some computation related stuff uh, to declare the votes uh, based on some other methods that you have uh, described? Yeah, yeah. No, that's certainly possible. From given the, just the voting record from that. We can get a lot of information and do, and we can show contrary results based on these things. We can do all that. I mean, for instance, with the actual voting data that you have got, we can we could show that supposing we were using proportionate representation, this is how the assembly would look. This is how the parliament would look, based based on different rules followed in different society. Of course, we can do that, and uh, I believe that there are people interested in these uh, center for. Uh, uh, developing societies has done some studies of this. I, I know Yogendra Yadav, I remember, was working on this many years ago before he started AAP and so on. You know? And uh, yeah, so, yeah. so people have that, studied these, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that way we can educate people, uh, yeah. maybe, and eventually we can go for a free and fair kind of an election. Yeah, I mean, uh, these are things that society should continuously debate on. I don't think there is one answer, right? The point is that it's important to discuss, debate, and on intellectual basis, you know, not just on emotional basis. Then society needs and formal arguments and, uh, I mean, academia have to get into this act. It should not be left to some small committees. And, I mean, at university level, we should be educated in these matters, right? When we talk about the, you know, masses of the country not you know, electorate being educated. We just go to our, at university level, we don't really have political education of this kind, right? So I mean in that sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh,
సార్ హలో ఓకే సార్ మై నేమ్ ఇస్ శ్రీ దేవ్ అండ్ సో ఐ హ్యావ్ అ రిమార్క్ అండ్ ద క్వశ్చన్ అస్ వెల్ సో సో వాట్ ఐ రెడ్ బిఫోర్ ఇస్ దట్ ఇన్ ది హారఫెన్ సివిలైజేషన్ ఆర్ ద ఇండస్ వ్యాలీ సివిలైజేషన్ uh it was a very democratic society where there was no uh, ruler or king or a government per se and yet they were uh, equal especially if you look at the bricks that were used it was like uh, i think uh, three uh, three length two width and one uh, something i don't know three is to two is to one something some ratio for the bricks yeah. and it was used throughout the entire empire yeah civilization mm-hmm. so how is uh, is it possible for a society to exist without these elections especially elections are about choosing a leader right so is it possible for a democratic mm-hmm. society to go without elections you know taking the ancient uh, people for example i might be wrong but still your view on that <laughs> okay so there are two things to say one is that uh, what uh, i mean that what you refer to is a very fascinating analysis so archaeologists have discussed this at some length and i think it's revealing that uh, in the harappan civilization it seems to be clear that there were no hierarchies that's clear in the sense that like you said uh, everybody you know there are no palaces i mean in what you see right and uh, so certainly in terms of living spaces even those baths public baths that they have uh there were no hierarchies it's clear that i, I mean this is all we can infer whether that meant a democratic society we expect that that meant that the functioning was democratic we don't really know but probably it was i'll put it that way that uh, so one thing that you are saying is that somehow a very important requirement in a democracy is abolishing hierarchy of course i mean we are talking about annihilation of caste in this country right so what are we talking about all the stuff i mean in some sense all the stuff that i talked about is completely trivial when compared with the magn- magnitude of annihilation of caste so that's a fundamental political principle right so some of the things that we are talking about are all on top i mean so abolishing social hierarchies rights living rights in terms of abolishing I mean, that equality is something much much more fun so i am not sure that mathematization has any answer to all this because those are you know non negotiable principles of justice right second thing um so did ancient societies have uh, such this thing so second thing is that elections are not about electing leaders elections are about electing representatives right i mean this is fundamental this is very important right you are talking about i mean this goes back to you know i can give examples from sangam literature right i mean all ancient societies many many ancient societies have thought about this the chinese have discussed this from uh, you know maybe 2000 years right so old civilizations i mean the greeks have talked about it at length and that's what western media talks about mostly but uh, people have thought through especially rural civilizations small cities have tried to argue that whenever the numbers go beyond a certain point you cannot have direct participation so you need representation and you need a mechanism for deciding representation right so representation based on what representation based on community represent based so profession representation based on what and then you say you know all that gets into problems you go for representation based on geography right and this is how this comes even in today's lecture somebody raised the issue of ha huh, but uh, you know what about representation of uh, communities right now representation based on geography clearly is violative of this and we have seen that so but you know these are things that so my point is that if you look at the fundamental logical principle of democracy it's not about leading electors at all it is not about leading i mean electing leaders it is not about uh, hierarchies it is even if you assume that they are equal you have annihilated hierarchies representative democracy is very important and on any scale of decision making you do need representation you need a mathematical principle for that which is all that we are talking about so i do think that we should uh, so on one hand the fundamental principles of social justice are something else but even assuming that there are important mathematical questions that are relevant to know
Uh, Bhavya wrote that she had some question and a comment. What software did you use? <laughs> what did I use? Uh, Beamer. Yeah. LaTeX Beamer. Everything is LaTeX. Yeah. I'll certainly share the PDF with you know for sure. Any other? Yeah, there was uh, on the chat box this link. Yeah, Graeber has been writing a, writing a lot about these. I don't know the particular one that. Uh, LaTeX and BMath, no LaTeX and Beamer. Sorry, I'll put it on. It's called the Beamer class. Sir, uh, could you please suggest some good books to start with for a beginner to read the mathematical yeah. theories of so, democracy? Amartya Sen's book in from all the way back from 1970 is probably the best beginning. I would still say that. Uh, you know, there are contemporary books. I'll send you. Uh, I'll send to we know that I'll send you, and then you can put it up. Yeah. Uh, much of it is 21st century research, I must say. Right. I mean, in the sense that a lot of this stuff uh, it has been an impetus in recent times, yeah. especially with the advent of the algorithmic algorithm theory crowd getting in. In fact, in India, almost all the people working on this from, are from theory of algorithms and combinatorics. Yeah, I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, uh, we started off this with Vijay Ambat talking about popularizing mathematics. And uh, so it's not just popularizing. We do not have public mathematical conversations because you know, in general, mathematics tends to obfuscate and not explain. And that's a real burden that mathematicians must carry, right? So I think the public perception that more data, more mathematics will only obfuscate the truth is a terrible thing. It's a terrible comment on mathematics. Mathematics should shed light, right? Mathematics should clarify, and it can. I mean, I know how much Vijay writes in Malayalam and writes in this. I write in Tamil and I think uh, I have gone to villages and talked to people. I have worked in adult education. I have run adult literacy classes and the people understand. <laughs> the point is that, uh, you know, mathematicians respecting common people and talking their language is unfortunately a rarity. So I think if we make the effort to talk to people, talk mathematics, explain, I think people understand. Uh, it's, I would say, a sad comment on our community that uh, we do not make as much of the effort as we should in this direction. So to all the students here, I, my request is that try talking mathematics to the general public. They will listen. The point is that the language that we use, the way we talk, yeah, exactly, Vijay. We need more mathematics on the street. We need street mathematics. We need a lot more. and. Uh, Definitely, people listen. Anybody who tries will tell you that never a problem. So, again, to all the students here, try. You will be surprised. So, the problem is, if of course, if your language is going to be just formulas and tables and charts and you know, I mean, it's as if we understand. I mean, when you read a newspaper article with a lot of charts and tables, do you immediately understand? Of course, you don't. Right? You don't. Uh, you feel like making the effort. So why would anybody else, right? So the simpler it is without dumbing down, I think. But that we need some training for ourselves to do these things. But uh, great questions. Yeah, thank you. I mean, these are things that we must think about. Okay. So I believe that sums up our discussion session. Finally, we have reached towards the end of today's uh, session. I believe it was a very success. Now I invite Ms. Tithi Biswas of NIT Trichy to express a formal vote of thanks for this wonderful session. Good morning everyone. It's my great honor and privilege 
to express the vote of thanks on this great occasion. First, let me thank Dr. R. Ramanujam from the Institute of Mathematical Science, Chennai for this great session. Today's webinar was full of knowledge and interesting facts and it reveals the interesting uh, fact about the mathematics in democracy. To be honest, uh, though it is known to us that mathematics is everywhere in our life, but it is unknown to us that how mathematics actually works in democracy. But by today's lecture, Sir explained us so many uh, theorem and lemma and also about interesting facts that how we can use in our uh, voting system and as well as choosing any uh, preference in our choice. So, thank you so much sir for this great uh, session and enlightening us with knowledge. Today, we are really blessed to have Vijay Kumar sir from Cochin University of Science and Technology being, uh, and I thank him for introducing our speaker. Now, I extend my gratitude to Dr. Binod Kumar P, Assistant Professor of TM Government College, Tirur Kerala, for arranging this webinar. And I also thank him for creating WhatsApp group named Math Aspirants and as well as arranging such, a, such as many wonderful national webinar. And in this occasion, I would like to thank all the members of Math Aspirants groups for their active participations. A special thank to Dr. Bijuman Sir, MG College, Eritri Kannur, Kerala for his technical support throughout the session. I must thank Ms. Ajuna NP, MPhil student of Cochin University of Science and Technology for the stunning YouTube promotion video for this webinar. I also thank to Jia Rose Johnson, research scholars of IIT Madras for the wonderful poster of this webinar. I also extend my thanks to Ms. Anjali, MP student of Cochin University of Science and Technology and also to Ms. Anne-Marie Tony, research scholars of Cochin University of Science and Technology for their enormous cooperation for arranging this event. I also thank Ms. Amishi Maithili from Delhi for hosting this event very beautifully. And last but not the least, I extend my wholehearted thank to all the participants for their calm and patience participation and making this event successful. So once again, I extend my thanks to each and everyone in this event. Thank you all. Friends, we will now be winding up the session. I would again like to thank everyone for attending this and a special thanks to our Ramanujan sir for his wonderful lecture and presenting uh, maths in such a wonderful point of view. I do not think any one of us would have ever thought of maths in such a beautiful light. Once again, a hearty thanks to all on behalf of the organizing team. Have a very nice day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.